Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm talking about ordinary regression. Now, ordinary regression is also called ordinary least worst regression. And all we're saying in this is the solution is found by minimizing di the difference between the predicted values of the outcome and the actual values of the outcome. The, and we're talking about the squared re uh, squared differences, so that's why it's least squared. But we're not actually doing an optimization problem at all. This is a well-defined analytical solution. So all you have to do is plug your numbers into a formula and it will give you the exact and correct answer compared to a situation where you actually have to do an optimization, which I will definitely talk about on this channel. To define the correct value of your beta, which I'll be talking about in a minute. I've actually been in a class where they turned regression into an optimization problem, and it was not silly. You can you can definitely do that. You can use any number of methods to find the correct value of beta as an optimization problem, but there's no reason to. You have analytical solutions. Okay, so I recorded this video before and my rant was a lot longer, but I'm going to stop it here. Okay, so people sometimes make a distinction between simple and multiple linear regression. I've never really cared about it, but I'm going to just talk about it because people do make that distinction. Okay, so simple linear regression is when you have one independent variable, so there's only so you just have one outcome and one predictor as that outcome. I prefer to use predictor and outcome more than independent and dependent just because I think it's immediately clear what I'm talking about. And I am more of a machine learning than hypothesis testing guy. So this language just doesn't feel right. Okay, so you also have multiple linear regression where you have one outcome and multiple predictors. That, that's the only difference. If you have multiple outcomes that you find it has simultaneously, that's multifariate regression. And that is actually a more complex thing, which you would learn about in an up-level statistics class or a graduate statistics class. Okay, so let's Let's go through the simple linear regression formula. This is the one with one predictor and one outcome. So y is the dependent variable or the outcome variable, however you want to talk about it. Then you have y. You have beta zero. And beta the betas in this excuse me. In this formula are parameters. No they're the values we want to estimate. We're trying to get at the actual value of this equation that exists in the world. We don't know beta zero and we don't know beta one. We're estimating them. So beta zero is used as the intercept a lot of the time. So. It is also the, the value of y when x, the value of x is zero. That may or may not be meaningful to you if x can take on zero. Um, if uh, x is, say, uh, the weight of adult, zero is absolutely meaningless. You can't have a zero weight and be alive. Or exist, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to try not to keep get distracted. So you have beta 1 and that is the value multiplied by your actual value of uh, your independent variable or your predictive variable. So y can be thought of as the sum of this beta 1 times the values of your predictive variable plus some intercept. And you remember from high school that, that creates a line. You can also think of it as y equals mx plus b. m would be beta 1. b would be beta 0. Just like. 
in, in high school. Okay, there's also some uh, implicit error. We hope that it's normally distributed and centered around zero with some standard deviation that we don't necessarily care about, but normally distributed and centered around zero would be a perfect error term. Okay, so we have the so we're going to be interpreting beta 1 here. Beta 0, the intercept, is not as interesting. Especially if your values of uh, your predictive variable can't be 0. It, and they can be 0, it's more interesting. Because then you can talk about the value of y at the point where x is 0. Okay, so if beta 1 the parameter for your predictive variable is positive, then your in independent and dependent variable increase together. If it's negative, your, uh, your independent independent variable increases, your de dependent variable decreases. If it's zero, then no relationship was found. Of course, if it's around zero, you have some, you have a p-value uh, associated with that, and that will tell you if that value is likely actually zero. And there's a lot of, of more nuance associated with that, and some philosophical debate whether any parameter is actually zero. And, most interventions have some effect. Sorry, I, I am getting way distracted. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so in this example, we have beta 0, the intercept 50, plus 5, which 5 would be the value of beta 1 times the actual value of the predicted variable or the independent variable. So, if you studied one hour, It'd be 5 times 1, 5, plus 50, so your exam score would be 55. Okay, so we're expanding that uh, single linear regression, simple linear regression. I really don't make the distinction, but a lot of people do, so here I am making the distinction. Okay, so here... We still have beta 0, we still have beta 1 and x1, but now we just have, just have more terms. We have beta 2, x2, x2 being the second predictor slash independent variable. You could have uh, an x3, we could have its own beta 3 all the way to n, with the thing, it could be arbitrarily many, you could have a thousand. Okay, so it's not really all that special, you just have more, and the interpretation gets a little bit harder, especially since you can have interactions between your variables, and I think interactions might be beyond the scope of this video, so I'm actually going to mention interactions and move on. Okay, so there's a lot of assumptions here. Linearity, we're assuming a linear relationship between the predictors and the outcome. If that isn't true, you're not going to capture it properly. The observations are independent of each other, so each value of your predictors don't depend on the other one. Oh, and outcome. The drawn from the same population but not like in an ordered fashion. How about get how about get it get after I feel like I'm not pronouncing that right, but it, that's an assumption. One that rarely gets tested, but it's an assumption and if you care about it, by all means look it up. The the normality of the residual 
the residuals are the difference between the value predicted from the from the regression and uh, the actual value in the training data. Now, a lot of uh, packages will give you residuals, and you can look at if they're normally distributed. If they're not normally distributed, that's a bit of a problem. And that goes back to that error term I talked about. So this right here, we need this to be normally distributed. It ideally is into that zero. If it's not, it, the assumptions of a linear regression break down. And you'd have to try to figure out if that's a, a problem. Some assumptions violations are all right and expected, and others are real bad. Okay. The multicollinearity. To say no, okay, no multicollinearity is an assumption, but you can deal with some. And there's a, a test for that using FIF. If FIF is lower than some threshold, we say it's probably all right. So uh, multicollinearity is when your uh, predictive variable have a association with each other. Let's say, uh, let's say you had weight in ounces and weight in pounds. If you used both of them, you'd have a bad time because they're essentially the same method that's multiplied by some uh, conversion factor. It would the algorithm has a hard time estimating that. What you really have is the same variable broken down into two variables, and you're giving it different weights on each side, and it doesn't work well. You need your variable to not be so highly associated with each other, and it's not that when it's a, a perfect correlation, even even not the no ideal correlation can be a problem. Okay, so we're talking about R squared, the which is a measure of how much the predictive variable to explain the outcome. And R squared is not perfect, and we I'll, I'm going to certainly talk about that. One thing is, if you keep adding predictors, the R squared will inevitably go up, even if those predictors don't have anything to do with the outcome. But there's ways for correcting that, but we'll just talk about R squared. So, an R squared of 1 says that 100% of the variability in the outcome are explained by the independent variable. And that's good. You would want that if, if it makes any sense. An R squared of exactly 1 it's often very suspicious. I might have in chemistry, and, and sometimes in, in analytical chemistry, we'd get like a 0.99. But even then, in a very controlled experiment, you, you don't get one. I'd be suspicious of a, a perfect correlation like that. I mean, R squared, not correlation. Even though those are very related methods. Okay. So. R squared is zero, which you're also unlikely to get. Because like I said, even if you have unrelated predictive variable, R squared will go up. It, it says that none of the variability in your outcome are explained by the predictive variable. Um, high R squared indicate a better fit. With the some caveat that you could probably correct for adding more variables. There's something called a thusted R squared that uh, that penalizes R squared for more predictors because unrelated predictors will make it higher. Okay, so obviously regression is a hypothesis test too, and so basically you're testing whether or not the coefficient are zero. So your null hypothesis is that your beta beta zero being the intercept and beta one through beta n being the coefficient on 
your predictive variable equals zero, alternative hypothesis is that they're not equal to zero. So that's a two-tailed hypothesis test. And when you do a regression in a statistical package, you'll get an overall hypothesis test p-value, the thing that this regression makes sense. It is actually an all right fit. Actually, I think I got too informal with that. The overall hypothesis test means something slightly different, but uh, you also get hypothesis test feed coefficient. That was the point I was getting to. You get hypothesis test for the intercept if the intercept equals zero and the coefficient on your actual outcome, I mean, predictive. Even when I use outcome and predictive, I confuse them. Okay, so anyway. So, you only get linear relationships. It's sensitive to outliers. Not about everything sensitive to outliers. You have to use robust statistical tests that are more nuanced to really not have that sensitivity to outliers. Um, Multicollinearity, you gotta fix for that if you're worried about it. And one way to do that is the VIF. And that's definitely a different, a topic for a different video. Okay, so in conclusion, it's an ordinary regression. It just minimizes the difference between the predicted values based on this equation and the actual values in the training data set. Okay, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching.